So today, I'm going to describe work that we've done over many years at Google and that we've now brought to everybody in open source and as cloud services towards making large-scale data processing, especially streaming processing, awesome. Going back uh, down memory lane, you know, large-scale processing, one of the seminal moments was the publishing of MapReduce, which was a, a pattern we had been using internally at Google for a while to do what Google was doing back then, you know, mostly um, indexing the web as well as collecting logs and analyzing logs of large number, at least at the time, large number of servers um, in a way that was manageable. So that, that was the tool that was very productive that in, you know, made Google successful in those early days and, and engineers were using day in and day out. Uh, pretty quickly though, we realized that a lot of the time um, was being spent by engineers optimizing the, the way they were writing their MapReduce. Because you know, we've all done the simple word count, you know, MapReduce, that's easy. In real life, when you're doing more complex, you know, realistic pipelines, there's lots of stages. If you write them naively, your performance is way worse than what it can be if you optimize that. So people got really good, which is good, but spent a lot of time, which is bad, optimizing pipelines. Uh, and, and the less experienced engineers were not optimizing them very well. And that wasn't very good for productivity. And so a team put together what is called Flume, which has nothing, nothing to do with Apache Flume. So the name is confusing. There's just two different things. But internally at Google, it's called Flume. Flume Java was the paper that was published. There's also a C++ version internally. And what Flume did is it allowed developers to not worry about writing uh, and using MapReduce, but write a much more natural um, pipeline in Java or in C++ using some parallel processing constructs. You know, we call them p-collection for um, you know, shardable objects and, and p-transforms p for transformations you can do in parallel. And those are just much more natural tools that people were using in, in their language. And then the platform, Flume, was doing the optimization that people used to do manually. And it got really, really good at that. Um, and so developers did not have to worry about that. And the developers did not even have to learn the details of how to optimize MapReduce. And so that, that took Google a long way uh, in improving the productivity of engineers, improving the performance of pipelines using Flume Java. Then we realized that even, uh, and what Flume was doing is compiling that to MapReduce in an optimized way. Then we realized that that wasn't the optimal runtime. And so instead of compiling to MapReduce, Flume can now also execute the pipeline directly. As, as a DAG, um, you know, and we don't have a paper about that, but in a way it's kind of similar to what Spark is doing, to what uh, you know, Hive used to be on MapReduce, now Hive on Tez, like it's that same kind of paradigm. And that, that was the next step, uh, you know, first MapReduce, then moving to a pipeline language, and then moving to native DAG execution. In parallel, there was a big need developing for much, more, much lower latency processing. And that's where Millwheel came in. And so Millwheel, is a separate service from Flume. It's an API developers can code to, which allow them to parallelize stream processing services. And that one too was published as a paper um, not, not too long ago and has been in use at Google for a while, uh, you know, very, very broad use. And so that's where we were a few years ago with Flume Java uh, or Flume C++ for, um, for you know, MapReduce style, even though it wasn't done on MapReduce anymore, and Millwheel. And in industry, the pattern was somewhat similar. You know, there's Hadoop, MapReduce, and then starting to be some stream processing systems. And managing these two systems, you know, neither of them really fit the bill by itself. You wanted more low latency, but you wanted the re reliability and scalability that only MapReduce was producing. So Nathan, uh, Nathan Mars had uh, defined what is now called the Lambda architecture. I don't think he used the term Lambda in that blog post. Uh, I would not have used that title, um, especially knowing that Eric would be in the room when I, when I talk about that, but that's Nathan's word, not mine. Um, and so in, in that paper, what he describes is, um, is something that can be you know, visualized this way, the Lambda architecture, where you basically solve the problem of neither Hadoop MapReduce nor streaming system like Storm being sufficient by using both. And so what that means is you have a fast pass where you process your data as soon as it arrives, and so that's represented by the storm bolt at the bottom. But you don't get, but this cannot guarantee you um, accurate results. But you know, it's good enough to get an approximation, um, which is why there's little wiggly results, which are you know, more or less in the right place, but not exactly. 
but you still want, you still need to have accurate results. And so in the Lambda architecture, what you do is you reprocess everything in batch mode, you know, every day, every four hours, whenever you want. And you decide what your batch window is. And so all those events which had been processed by, by Storm get now reprocessed in MapReduce. Um, and then at the end, you, know, you discard the old ones, which are unreliable, you put the new ones. And so at any point in time, you have a reliable view of the past, and you have an approx approximate view of the present, which, you know, is, that's good. That's much better than just one or just the other. So it's a very, you know, ingenious and, and practical way to put those together. But in the end, it's not very satisfying. That's not something, we not, haven't used that pattern internally. It just feels, it just feels wrong to have two systems, to A, just do the work twice, just from an infrastructure perspective, you know, you burn, uh, you know, uh, twice as much CPU just to do the work. But even worse, from a software development perspective and from a management perspective, you have two different systems to manage, which is expensive. You have to write the code twice, which is expensive. And it also means that even though you may think you've implemented the same algorithm, you can never be sure. There are different bugs in different ones, and so that becomes pretty hard to then try to have consistent results. So that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice engineering uh, pattern to do that, but it really isn't satisfying as uh, a long-term solution. And so what I wanted to do is unify all that and allow, well, first, you know, our developers internally, but now everybody, um, in, in everybody you know, on cloud or using what we've contributed to open source, to do, to process once and to get the same benefits of having quick approximate results and then having uh, reliable results. And so we've done that through a new, uh, a new programming model, which we call Dataflow, which is really rooted in all the data processing work Google has been doing over the last 10 years, you know, using MapReduce, using Flume, um, and using Millwheel, so both for batch and streaming. And so that's what I'm going to describe today as, mostly I'm going to describe that as um, a programming model to, uh, to um, account for, for the challenges of doing that. A big part of those challenges come back to the fact that there are two times that you have to deal with. There is the event time, you know, when things actually happen, and then there is the stream time, when the, the bytes that represent the event are actually processed by your system. You know, and for some system, it's the, the time when they receive it. For other system, it's when they actually process it. W one way or the other, this is, this is time of the infrastructure, when you actually get those bytes and when you can process them. And the two are fundamentally different. So first and foremost, we need to acknowledge these are two different times. And then a lot of what I'm going to describe is about how do you deal with that? How do you live in a world with two times? And so to illustrate how we're progressing on that path, you know, let's start with the simplest thing. If you have a finite input, the, you know, it, the, 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 then, then the processing is easy. You know, that's what MapReduce works very well, or you know, whether MapReduce use Flume or, or you know, Dataflow. Many, 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 many parallel processing frameworks will do that for you. Now, unfortunately, most useful interesting data sources are not like that. You know, like the first, the first word count, usually we run that on the, you know, the works of Shakespeare, and that's nice, because you know, one of the good things about Shakespeare is he doesn't write anymore, so you don't have to rerun the job there. But most useful things like logs, things like sensor measurements, obviously they keep having new data. So you adapt the pattern, and you just do a sequence of MapReduce. So you, don't, you decide your batch window, whether it's one hour, four hours, you know, daily. You get all the events that arrive in that period of time, and then you let your developers write code to tell you, okay, what do, I, what do you want to do with those events? And the developer can write that code, which is nice, but has the downside that a lot of what you care about is actually split between windows. You know, if you're looking at traffic from your web users, the web user doesn't care that you went from 10.59 to 11 o'clock. Like to them, you know, they just start their session and they stay on, the, on your site and then they leave. And you know, maybe they stay within one hour, maybe it takes them three hours. So the things you care about, you know, in this case the web sessions, are artificially broken down by your batch window. And so that puts the burden on your developer to deal with that because the developers get the events in batches. And so you know, they can either just ignore that and say, you know, I don't care. Every session ends at the top of the hour. It's a new session as far as I'm concerned next hour, which you know, is one way to do that, but it's pretty bad because that's not the reality. Or the developer is responsible for trying to bridge the sessions and, uh, and, 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 and you know, re, re, uh, re-establish them across windows. Another downside is the latency. 
the, uh, at, the, 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 at the very best, you have to wait for the duration of one, uh, one batch window plus whatever your processing time is. And so you don't get any result until your batch has run for that entire window. And so that, that defeats the, the requirement for low latency that we had as well. So instead of doing that, what we've been focusing on is accept that what you're getting is a stream um, and think about it as a continuous stream of events and equip your developers, give them the tools they need to be productive dealing with that reality as opposed to telling them, well, you have to deal with batches and figure out how you put things together. So streams are hard. For one thing, they're unordered. You know, things arrive, the, way the, the order in which they arrive doesn't have to be the order in which the event happen. You, know, you can have different, different streams coming together, which have very different paths that they take to get to you. Even within one stream, you know, things happen and some events can be reordered. So you have to deal with that. You have to deal with the uh, events coming in any order. It's obviously unbounded. And so you cannot wait until you have your data. Yeah, at some point, you have to you know, get up and start processing. And so how do you decide when you can do that? Uh, and what happens when things happen uh, that you did not expect that have been delayed? And the time skew varies. So the time skew is the difference between the two times I was mentioning earlier, the event time and the stream time. Now, in an ideal world, this would be a, a, a line with a slope of one. Right? There'd be one time, but that's not the ideal world. There's always some kind of delay. And worse, the delay changes over time. Uh, no. In some cases, you have some very regular systems where you know, it's a small delay, it's pretty constant, you know, a few milliseconds. In other cases, the delay can be huge. Uh, and it can vary widely. So that, that, that's cute. For, for example, it could be minutes. You know, if I go skiing and I have my GPS app running on my phone, and then I go to the back of the mountain where I don't have cell phone coverage, and the GPS is still working fine, so it still tracks me as I go down the mountain. I get to the bottom and back into the valley. The, the cell signal reconnects. All my GPS points upload suddenly, and now you know, whoever is on the other end tracking those events is getting half an hour worth of data you know, within, within a second. So you know, it could be a really, really big skew, um, just it could be small, and it's unpredictable. So these are the three hardest thing about stream. So how do you deal with that? Well, there's about four different ways to do that with increasing amount of usefulness um, and, and, uh, and uh, flexibility for the developer. First, you can say, I don't care. Like sometimes your processing does not care about time. If you're just waiting for, if you're just filtering, waiting for some event to happen, you know, tell me when someone opens this door. I don't care about time. I just look at all the events, and when it's an event about somebody opening this door, I'm just going to select that one. Very easy. If that's your problem, you're done. But that's not a general solution for stream processing. There is a larger set of cases where you can also ignore time. So it's not just filters. You know, if what you're doing is to join two elements, you, know, you send a request, uh, you, know, you see a request being sent, sorry, and then you see a response coming back. You want to put them back together you know, via some you know, header or something, and you want to see how the response maps the request. That's nice and easy. You just hold on to one until you see the other. The time itself is not relevant here. It's just part of the payload. You can also do approximations. So there are algorithms um, that help you deal with that and, uh, you know, and, and return approximate results. It's useful in some cases, but what we're after here is something that is actually reliable in your results. So if you're looking for that, then those approximations by definition don't work. Another option kind of goes back to what we're discussing about for, for batching is, you know, yes, you still batch. Just use batch in narrower and narrower window. So you can have lower latency um, and, uh, you know, because the, the, the time delay between each of the batch windows is much more smaller, but you're still forcing your developers to deal with stream time. You're still forcing them to understand that, you know, I'm giving you what I have. I'm not giving you what happened at times t. It's up to you to then keep track of things if you want to have a, have a view which is more realistic and, and stitch them back together. Or you can do to what's the gold standard, which is windowing by event time. It's telling users, telling your programmers, imagine you live in a perfect world. Write your code as if you live in a perfect world. Now, that's pretty appealing. Um, and in a perfect world, the stream time doesn't matter. It's just like, you know, I don't care the architecture of the processor on which I run. I, that, I don't care. I just want to write my business logic, write the code to express my processing. If I can do that in event time, it's perfect. You know, very often people want to do 
um, fixed windows, just you know, uh, uh, have windows of time in true time, not in stream time when I saw the, the data, but when things actually happen. So you know, if I'm looking at uh, energy consumption across the US and I want to see how you know, some, some event on TV affects that, like what, what I care about is the true time when the energy consumption happened in the home, not when I actually got the results. And so it's very convenient as a developer to be able to write your code using that as the primitive time and let the infrastructure deal with the messy reality. Same thing if you're doing the kind of session um, I was describing earlier. If what you're doing is trying to uh, window the events by session, you don't have to deal with those arbitrary boundaries. You just say, you know, this is the definition of my session. When all the events in the session are there, I just want to group them together and process. And you let the infrastructure deal with putting them together. And so that's the model which, um, which Dataflow is providing in its programming API. It is, uh, no, these are just two of the window, the most popular windows, the fixed windows. We have sliding windows, we have session, we have no other, window, other type of windows built in. And you can build your own windowing strategy and then let your developers write their code to that, to that windowing strategy. So the way we do that, sorry, going back. The way we do that is by asking, asking three main questions. We're asking developers to tell us what they want to do. You know, what's the logic? What's the code you want to, you want to process? We're asking them to tell us in event time when they want things to run. So if they're doing time windows, they tell us, in event time, I want things to run on bucket or on windows of you know, two minutes. Uh, or if they're doing sliding window, you know, I want a sliding window of, of that time. So they can tell us that in event time. And then, because unfortunately, reality is still there, we give them a way to tell us when in stream time to make that happen. And I'll describe a bit more about how that works. And so you, know, we, you still have to map that to the real world. But what we're doing here is we're completely disconnecting that. The place where you write your logic is allowed to live in this perfect world where everything is, is, uh, is indexed based on real stream time, sorry, on real event time. And in a separate piece of your code, you describe the way you bind that to reality. And so in practice, these are the three APIs that make that possible. The what, the you know, how do I group and what do I join with what, kind of all the, all the logic of my computation, uh, that, that's in the aggregation API. The where uh, is the windowing API, which lets you say what kind of window do you want applied? You know, again, event-based window, so sliding, sliding, or fixed window. And then when, that's where the binding happens between the ideal world and the messy world in which we live. And so we have constructs like watermark and triggers, which let you keep track of the progress of your streams, let you define triggers at which you want to compute. So you, know, you may want to get early results um, and then we recompute as you get more results, or you may want to hold until you get your results. And so, you know, we can't predict the future anymore than anybody else, but we can give you a nice isolated way for the developer to define that uh, and not pollute their business logic with that and then let us optimize execution of those. So in practice, what's the benefit of doing that? Well, you still get low latency approximate results, just like with Lambda, you know, obviously, Data flow does not make events arrive any faster. You know, the, if the events are, if, if some events take time to arrive, we have to wait for them. But when they arrive, you get those, well, you get the results based on the events that have arrived. The difference from Lambda is that as soon as the missing events arrive, you get correct results, as opposed to, oh, my correct results are only going to arrive tomorrow morning once my batch has gone. Now the correct results arrive as soon as the data has been received. Even more importantly, from a, from a productivity and frankly a cost perspective, is that it's one system. So you only pay for one system, you have less infrastructure. Probably even more important, you have to manage one system. So it's a lot less to debug, a lot less to patch, a lot less to optimize. And you only write your code once. So as I was saying, you know, it's not two code paths. You can easily compare what you got uh, what you got, uh, what, well, you don't have to go back. You have one set of results, actually. You don't have to worry about, did I get that result from streaming? Did I get it from batch? Are they consistent? That's very powerful because it also means that in some cases, you know you're going to run in batch mode. You know, maybe your data only arrives in batch mode. You know, maybe your partner 
FTPs a file to you every night. Maybe you get a truck with a bunch of disk drive. And so you know from the start, I'm not going to be using streaming. You can still use Dataflow to process your pipeline. And you know, in that case, you will not have to worry about triggers and windowing. But the business logic will apply in an optimized way for a batch use case where the input is finite. And, and then you can have an optimized, uh, an optimized um, execution of your pipeline. It also means if you change your algorithm, it's very easy to reprocess historic information. You, know, you find a bug in your pipeline, you fix it. Now the new events will be processed correctly. You can take the exact same code that you fixed and run that on your historical data if you want to go back in time and reprocess. And now you know that that reprocessed data will be compatible and, and, and con consistent with your new streaming data because it's the same code that run twice, that run on, on the old data that is running on the new data. So these are the programming models improvement. Those are in no way tied to Google or Google Cloud. We have open source that. There is a GitHub project under Apache 2.0 called uh, Cloud Dataflow SDK. And that SDK basically has the API described and allows you to write programs. The way the SDK works, it has runners, which is what binds your program to an execution environment. And so there is a local runner. You can just run on your laptop just to you know, be able to debug locally and program on the plane and all that. We provide a cloud runner, and I'll say a few words about the cloud service that we provide where you can take your Dataflow programs and ask Google to run them for you. Our friends at Cloudera have created a Spark runner. So you can take the Dataflow program, the exact same one that can work on the Google service, and run that on your Spark cluster, you know, anywhere on-prem or you know, deployed in the cloud somewhere. And then our, our friends at Data Artisan, which is the company behind Apache Flink, um, has also created a Dataflow runner for Flink. And so if you, if you use Flink, you can also, you know, wherever your Flink cluster is deployed, you can run Dataflow. So the programming model is completely open source and portable. What we've done, similar to what you know, Eric was doing with Kubernetes, we also offer it as a service. And so if you want to run at Google, there is a Cloud Dataflow service in which you don't have to worry about any infrastructure. You don't have to deploy a cluster. You don't have to scale the cluster. All you have to do is write your code. So that's the, the user code and SDK. You write your code, and then you send your code to us. And what you get is a management console, which shows you your pipeline and shows you the progress of your pipeline. You know, if it's a stream pipeline, we'll show you the throughput at every point in the process. If it's a batch pipeline, we will just show you the, the progress of the various stages. And that's all you have to worry about. Under the cover, if you submit the, your data flow program to our service, we will optimize it using you know, all the experience I was describing from Flume Java and many, many years of optimizing uh, pipelines. And so we'll optimize it for you. We'll deploy workers for you. We'll configure the workers. You know, these are your machines. These are your VMs. You know, we can use Docker to bring any custom binary you want. Um, and so, but we'll deploy, we'll auto-scale for you, and we'll report on the progress. So it really gives you a no-ops way to run your pipelines continuously in streaming mode or to run batch pipelines on the, on the platform. It fits in a larger picture of cloud services. And so in a way, if, you are, if, if you're thinking about the, um, the, the life cycle of the data from ingestion, so you have a bunch of ingestion services, to preparation, storage, and processing, Dataflow can play in two places. Dataflow is used a lot in preparation. So as your data arrives, you may want to format it, to enrich it, to anonymize it, to you know, clean it. And so that can be done in Dataflow. Again, you write your pipeline once. If data is streaming, that's fine. If the data arrives in batch, that's fine too. The same program can take care of that and write it into our storage systems. What we see often is people realize, as they're using that for data preparation, like, hey, I'm touching data right now. If there is some um, you know, low latency analysis I want to do, why not just do it there in line? And so they do real-time analysis, real-time alerts you know, as part of that pipeline because it's, you know, it's just code. Data flow is also used over here. So I put it twice, but really it's the same data flow service. We see it used on stored data. And in that context, it's not used for preparation so much as for analysis. And it comes in complement to tools like BigQuery. For those of you who are not familiar with BigQuery, it's a large-scale, fully managed SQL engine based on Dremel, uh, another paper that, uh, that was published uh, a few years ago. And so BigQuery, just like Dataflow, does not require you to administrate anything. 
all you have to do is you know, bring your data and send your SQL queries, and we'll run the queries for you, and you know, we run some you know, individual queries that touch several petabytes of data in one query. So really, really large scale, fully managed service. So if SQL is the right way to describe your processing, BigQuery is the tool. If SQL is not the right way, if you'll be writing some code, then Dataflow can play there. Or you can use Hadoop or Spark, and we've done a lot of work on the platform to make Hadoop and Spark run really well at Google. We can auto-deploy them for you. We've created connectors to Google Cloud uh, storage system. So there's Hadoop and Spark have connectors to BigQuery, to Bigtable, to, cloud, to Google Cloud Storage, which allows data in those systems to appear using native Hadoop interfaces, you know, whether the file system one for cloud storage or some uh, record-oriented interfaces. And so your data is really available to all services. You don't have those islands where you know, you've loaded the data into that HDFS cluster. It's the data is there um, in, you know, whether if, if it's structured data, you know, and if it's analytics data, which is app and only, then the best place is BigQuery, which is a storage service in addition to being a query service. We recently uh, opened a big table, uh, like the original NoSQL store for everybody, or cloud storage uh, for file storage. And so wherever you decide to put your data, it's not locked. It is reliably stored, and you can bring all the processing systems you want including Dataflow. So that's, that's what, how Dataflow fits Dataflow as a Google service. That's how it fits in Google Cloud Platform. But again, Dataflow as a programming model is something you can take and run anywhere you want. And so it, you know, this is somewhat simplified, but what we're really aiming for, for all our big data services on Google Cloud, and especially for Dataflow and for BigQuery, is to take away all the burdens that typically come with managing a large-scale data processing infrastructure the resource provisioning, dealing with growth, dealing with scale, making it reliable, optimizing, dealing with performance issues, monitoring it. That's, that's what we do you know, day in and day out internally anyway. And so we want to take that burden away and allow you to focus on writing your SQL queries, writing your um, data flow programs in Java, and, and there's a Python version coming soon, um, and really spend more time just describing what you want done with your data and sp not spend time um, managing it and benefiting from just uh, the economies of scale and, 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 um, and, and the performance of Google's infrastructure. So this is where you get more information um, about the services I described. You know, they're all on the cloud.google.com. Um, mostly to Dataflow on the left side. The, I put the link on GitHub to you know, the Dataflow Java SDK, which is where you can get that portable SDK. 